Hey everybody, it's um, my pleasure to be here today and to introduce uh, Tammy Bodner. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that UBC uh, Vancouver's Point Grey campus is situated on the uh, traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam. And it is my great honor to introduce Tammy. We've known each other for 14 years by my count, uh, so it's been a while. Uh, she graduated with her PhD in neuroscience uh, in 2016, and she examined the impacts of prenatal alcohol exposure on a variety of endpoints, including uh, behavior, the various endpoints in the brain and the immune system, um, and an animal model, which uh, she'll talk about in rats. Uh, she's currently a research associate in the Department of Cell Cellular and Physiological Sciences at UBC, and she shifted in, uh, in some ways uh, quite a bit. So now she looks at clinical populations and studying how prenatal alcohol exposure affects human subjects, uh, focusing on immune function and the microbiome. So you'll see there are a lot of connections between what she did in the animal model and what she's currently doing. Uh, as an Indigenous scholar, uh, Tammy's interested in risk and resilience factors affecting the health of Indigenous peoples, and she actively fosters research partnerships with Indigenous communities and empowers those youth to advocate for their own health within their own communities. Uh, she has a, on about 30 papers by my count in a wide variety of journals, and they cover a wide variety of topics, as you'll see today, from studies of animal behavior to neuroscience, immunology, and most recently, uh, microbiome, and uh, like I said, epigenetics, and spanning the, the range from animal to clinical work. So this is, in fact, what I most admire about Tammy is her integrative approach and fearlessness to branch out, try new things, um, and, and really master those things. Uh, she currently holds funding from CHR, the Azraeli, Azraeli uh, Foundation, and as well as an NIH grant. And I'll end by saying she also taught Psych 306A for me when I was on sabbatical, and her teaching evaluations were far better than mine. Uh, so uh, she's also a very good instructor, as you'll see today. Okay. Please join me in welcoming Sammy Bob. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Semler, for that introduction. Um, it's really fun to be back here in particular because actually I started my very first research experience was on this floor of the Kenny building back when it was pre-renovation, early, early day. So it's just kind of a nice, nice place to be back. Um, and Kieran did a great land acknowledgement. I, something I just wanted to add um, to this acknowledgement, I think as an Indigenous person myself, um, reconciliation and just recognizing Indigenous people is really important to me, both, you know, in research and just in regular life as well. Um, and something that I saw recently someone do in the context of a land acknowledgement is also just talk about something that they're doing to sort of concretely support Indigenous people in some context. And I think that's just a beautiful and interesting way to kind of take things a little bit further as well. Um, and I'll talk a lot about my research involving Indigenous partnerships, but I just wanted to kind of shift the script a little bit and talk about something else um, that I'm doing to better understand the diversity of Indigenous cultures here in Canada. Um, so what I'm doing is reading novels by Indigenous Canadians. Um, and so maybe if you're looking for a recommendation, I think my two favorites this year sorry, were Seven Fallen Feathers by Tanya Tal Tal Talaga um, and Son of a Trickster, which is just more fiction um, by Eden Robinson. And then before I begin, I also wanted to just thank the psychology department and Dr. Somer for the invitation to be here today. It's really a big honor. Um, so as mentioned, I started, um, I kind of grew, I feel like I grew up here at UBC, did my PhD um, degree here, um, and also really love teaching in, in the Department of Psychology as well as Biomedical Engineering. All right, so I thought I'd just start off with kind of a brief overall research framework that kind of captures my current research as well as my overall research plans and ongoing projects. Um, so broadly speaking, I'm really interested in how a variety of exposures, experiences, adversities basically get under, the, get under the skin during pregnancy and early life to shape neurodevelopment and impact health and mental health over the life course. Um, and included in this list of adversities, experiences and such are things like bacterial and viral infections, maternal immune activation, um, early life maltreatment and neglect. Uh, stress during sensitive uh, developmental windows, socioeconomic disadvantage versus advantage, um, medication and drug exposure during pregnancy, as well as sensitive periods, 
um, alcohol exposure and specifically prenatal alcohol exposure, which I'll focus in on in a second. And then finally, dietary differences. So things like um, high fat diet or ca uh, cafeteria diet, for example. And following these exposures, adversities, experiences, I'm really interested in understanding risk versus resilience to various mental health, as well as overall health problems, with the overall goal of better understanding and improving health and well being. Um, and as I mentioned, today I'll be zeroing in on um, my studies involving the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure, but I'm also happy to talk about other aspects of this, this research wheel later on if it's of interest. Um, and I also just wanted to mention, especially in the context of my clinical research, while I'm looking at prenatal alcohol exposure, um, I'm often considering a lot of these other factors as well. Um, so in the context of prenatal alcohol exposure, there's often early life adversity, perhaps, or socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, so it's not necessarily looking at one of these factors on their own. And then really integral and important to my research framework is um, taking a translational approach. So as Dr. Soma mentioned, um, I work with clinical populations. Um, I also partner with indigenous communities and then go back to animal models to really look at mechanism of disease. Um, and today I'm gonna show a quick snapshot of some rodent data as well as some non-human primate data. Um, and I really see the importance of going back and forth between models. So, you know, studying a clinical condition in, in a cohort of individuals, flipping back to understand community, studying, studying this same thing in community, and then zooming in on some mechanistic detail in the animal model. Um, because it's really, you can only really layer on those social determinants of health, you know, things like race and SES in those human studies, but oftentimes to really get at mechanism and fine tune and get a fine tuned understanding really requires um, those animal models. So I really see the importance of both. Um, and since I'll be focusing on research involving prenatal alcohol exposure, I really wanted to just start with just a little broad context. Um, why study prenatal alcohol exposure? Why is it important? Is it important? Um, and I think, I think it's pretty fair to say that alcohol is a problem in today's society. Um, it's the most commonly consumed substance. And in Canada, about 80% of men, just over 70% of women report drinking in the past year. Um, in BC, these numbers are pretty similar. About 76% of people 15 years and older drank. Um, these numbers are actually quite stable in general, exception a little bit during the pandemic. There's a bit of a blip there. Um, but the only data point that's actually increasing um, are, is binge drinking in um, women is on the rise in Canada as well as North America in general. And I think these statistics are really, really important to think about in the context of pregnancy because just over half of pregnancies are unplanned. Um, and so with, you know, 76% of individuals, women consuming alcohol, there's likely quite a lot of alcohol exposure even prior to the recognition um, of pregnancy. And then in addition, about 10 to 15% of pregnant women continue to consume alcohol during pregnancy. Um, and this is all despite overwhelming public health messaging that there's no known safe amount of alcohol to be consumed during pregnancy. Um, and as well, there's, you know, messaging is starting to, to come across that there's actually benefits to not consuming alcohol even prior to their, during the preconception period for both men and women. But oftentimes that messaging, especially um, targeting men, just doesn't really get out there. Um, so really moral of the story is that prenatal alcohol exposure is really a problem in today's society um, and will likely continue to be one for some time. Uh, so what happens when alcohol is consumed during pregnancy? Uh, this can result in a group of conditions that are known under the umbrella, ter umbrella term of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And broadly speaking, individuals with FASD can show deficits in really a wide range of domains. Um, this includes things like executive function, cognitive function, social behavior, endocrine immune function, which I'm gonna be talking about a little bit uh, more today. Um, but basically the majority of domains are affected in one way or another. Um, and one particular challenge in the field is that currently there really are no good biomarkers for FASD. It requires maternal confirmation of alcohol consumption. And so in the cases of adoption or cases where perhaps phys physicians don't ask about alcohol consumption, this can make diagnosis challenging um, and sometimes kids are misdiagnosed with autism or ADHD, for example. And this can cause problems because intervention strategies, medications um, tend to need to be different depending on, on the condition. And then interestingly, if we compare the prevalence of FASD here, which you can see in red, to other common neurodevelopmental disorders, here I'm showing autism, cerebral palsy, uh, Down syndrome, fragile X, 
What's really interesting is that the prevalence of FASD is generally estimated at about 5%. Um, and this is higher than all of those other conditions um, combined. And because of the challenges, known challenges associated with diagnosis, this 5% is, is likely a gross underestimate as well. Um, but you know, despite this being the most prevalent um, condition, it really hasn't necessarily received um, the research attention uh, it deserves. So if we look at the percent of publications by disorder color coded in the same way, you probably can barely even see that red tiny sliver. Um, that's the number of publications representing FASD as compared to say Down syndrome here in blue. So despite being the most prevalent condition, it really doesn't necessarily receive um, that same level of research attention. All right, so with that back in your mind, I wanna to start to moving into describing some of the background work that really led to some of my uh, current research projects. So I started out by really examining how alcohol exposure, prenatal alcohol exposure affects the brain um, and specifically looking at the neuroimmune system. And I was really interested in the neuroimmune system um, that is basically cytokines, the hormones um, of the immune system, because they're really, really critical in shaping brain de development. Um, they play roles in key functions like neurogenesis, synaptic pruning, synaptogenesis, et cetera. But they also just receive a lot less attention in sort of brain development uh, research in general. Um, and it's been shown that changes in the maternal immune environment during pregnancy, so things like infection, for example, really alter and can fine tune that balance of um, those cytokines within the brain, which basically has a consequence potentially detrimental consequence for neurodevelopment as well as behavior. So here, just highlighting um, when the amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines increases, this tips the balance to what is known as a pro-inflammatory bias um, with resulting impacts on brain and behavior. Um, and essentially, this can actually put the organism on a pathway to pathology to developing health problems and other um, issues later on in life. And I started out by basically looking at the hypothesis that prenatal alcohol exposure um, would affect that fine inflammatory by, uh, balance in the brain, and that this may be driving some of those known impairments that occur in, in individuals who are exposed. So I started with a very pretty basic study to, to start answering this question um, and, and look at cytokines during development, both in the brain and in the periphery. And I used um, our well-established animal model, which basically involves exposing sprogdolly rats, um, to one of, three, th one of three diets throughout uh, pregnancy. The first diet, um, the first group was administered a liquid ethanol diet where about 36% of calories were derived from ethanol. We also have a pear fed group, which is a nutritional control um, group that basically were matched in terms of their food intake to an alcohol exposed animal. Alcohol exposed animals eat less. And then finally, um, a basic control that received a pelleted version of the liquid diet. And then those dams went on to have pups. And then I collected samples from these offspring at three different ages, birth, postnatal day eight, and weaning. Um, and just in the sake of time today, I'm just going to focus in on this one time point uh, of postnatal day eight. Um, and here, the, the key measures of interest were those cytokine levels in the brain um, and body. And so overall, what did we see? So in general, we found that alcohol-exposed animals had elevated levels of a wide range of generally very pro-inflammatory cytokines within the brain. And this was most um, common in areas including the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. But also, we also saw elevated levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines um, in the blood as well. And so generally, kind of going back to that balance model that I showed in the previous slide, it really looks as if that critical cytokine balance was shifted to more of a pro-inflammatory phenotype um, as a result of that prenatal alcohol exposure. But one of the big questions that came about from this research and this study was, what is really driving this increase in inflammation, especially when it came to the peripheral or the plasma um, levels of cytokines? Because essentially, the immune cells in the blood are not long lived, the alcohol exposure has ceased. And so what is, what is perpetuating that inflammatory signal um, within the organism? And so I'll come back to that question in a moment, but this has really kind of shaped where some of the research is going today. Um, and then next, as I transitioned uh, to my postdoc, I had the opportunity to start to look at clinical populations um, of, with individuals with FASD. And I started to collaborate um, with Dr. Tina Chambers at UCSD to look at how prenatal exposure affects immune function in a very similar way um, in humans. 
And Dr. Chambers was conducting a, a longitudinal study at the time based in Western Ukraine, um, where she was recruiting pregnant people who were either consuming alcohol or not, um, or low, extremely low to no level of alcohol consumption during pregnancy, um, and collecting blood uh, when they came in for some of their prenatal testing, and then subsequently tracking the children um, after birth. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll just zero in on the data collected from the kids, but we also did some assessments in um, the maternal samples as well. But what was really interesting and kind of special about this study, because it was longitudinal, um, we were able to look at neurodevelopmental outcomes in the kids as well, something that we didn't necessarily have the opportunity or, or do in the rodent model. All right, so here my question was really similar to the RAP project, basically this idea of whether prenatal alcohol exposure is actually having an impact on cytokine levels within these kids. Um, but as I mentioned, we had the opportunity to link back to neurodevelopment. So here, instead of just looking at alcohol exposed kids versus unexposed kids, I basically classified kids in, into four different categories. So the first here were kids that had low to no alcohol exposure and went on to show typical development. Um, the second group were kids that, again, had low to no alcohol exposure, but went on to show neurodevelopmental delay. The third group was alcohol exposed um, kids that went on to have typical neuro neurodevelopment. And that final group were alcohol exposed kids that went on to show neurodevelopmental delay. So measured cytokines in the plasma from these kids um, and then use an analysis technique called constrained principal component analysis, basically to see whether we could identify different immune networks or inflammatory signal within those four um, groups that I just described. So basically what we identified was four different networks of cytokines that were differentially activated or inhibited between those groups. Um, the first group, the first network that was identified, I termed um, the alcohol independent uh, neurodevelopmental delay group. And I kind of highlighted in yellow there, if you can see. Um, and the reason I called it the alcohol independent neurodevelopmental delay network is basically this network was most active in kids that had low to no exposure and showed neurodevelopmental delay. And what was interesting is we kind of sort of frame this as maybe a non-specific neurodevelopmental delay um, that was occurring. But what was really interesting is that this activation, we saw activation of a couple key cytokines like IL-15 and TNF-beta, which are actually cytokines that have been shown and linked to other neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. Um, the other network that we identified, uh, we termed the alcohol exposure network. And because basically you can see here, I should have mentioned the, the dark, this, the colors are showing levels of activation with the darker color meaning higher level of cytokine all the way down to the light blue mean light dampened cytokine expression. Um, so this alcohol exposure network was basically activated in the same way what in, in both groups of kids that had alcohol exposure. So essentially, if you were exposed, you show heightened levels of these three, three cytokines, but it wasn't really distinguishing between those that had neurodevelopmental delay versus those that were showing typical development. And then finally, we identified um, an um, alcohol risk resilience network. And basically for this network, which you can see here, we had an opposing pattern of activation and inhibition of three cytokines and two cytokines in those two groups that were alcohol exposed. So a differential pattern in individuals that went on to show neurodevelopmental delay versus those that showed typical development. So I think the big take home message here in a more complex way, but very parallel to what we saw in the rodent work is that kids with alcohol, prenatal alcohol exposure um, that also had neurodevelopmental delay showed a really unique cytokine signature in the blood. Um, but again, that kind of brought me back to that same question is what's actually driving this pattern. This is through up to three and a half years later following that alcohol exposure, and we're seeing a different cytokine profile in the blood. Um, so what is actually driving and causing this effect? So before I move into what I think is causing those changes, I just wanted to briefly introduce the microbiome for those who might be not as familiar, um, because spoiler, I really think that the microbiome could be part of the, the key driver of some of those changes that, that I'm seeing both in the rodent studies and the clinical studies. Um, so just to give a brief overview, um, so the GI tract contains thousands of, of different species of bacteria. Um, generally, they can be classified into two different phyla, Firmicutes, Bacteroidetes. Um, and these bacteria, I think, haven't, haven't been given necessarily throughout time the, the emphasis that they deserve because they really play an important symbiotic role um, with the host. Uh, they do a lot of things like help extract energy from food. Um, they play important roles in synthesizing things like amino acids, 
Uh, they also within the gut form barriers um, against pathogens. So a healthy microbiome is absolutely critical um, to health. And when, those, when that microbiota changes, uh, which is generally known as uh, dysbiosis, um, this is highly linked to disease. Um, and basically the list of disease, diseases that are linked to changes in the microbiome is growing daily, but some of the big ones include things like inflammatory bowel disease, cancers, cardiovascular diseases, et cetera, um, as well as conditions like mental health problems, including depression, anxiety. And something I didn't yet mention about FASD, but I think it's important to talk about now is that there's actually a really disproportionately high rate of mental health problems in individuals with FASD. So about 94% of people with this condition will go on to develop some sort of mental health problem in their life course. And it's actually really, really high when you compare this to the general population, where only about 30% um, of the population will develop a mental health um, problem over their life course. All right, so all of that kind of led to my current research framework, um, where basically my hypothesis is that prenatal alcohol exposure is altering the composition of the gut microbiota and also impacting the integrity of the gut barrier, either by directly impacting um, like gut closure, for example, or also sort of indirectly through changes in the microbiome composition, basically causing it to be leaky um, such that bacterial components can leak through the gut uh, and, and essentially then enter circulation. And when that happens, this basically leads to inflammation. Um, and so kind of hypothesizing here that this could be potentially part of what's driving that pro-inflammatory bias identified in kids with FASD, as well as in our animal studies. And that subsequently in response to this peripheral inflammation, the signal uh, is transmitted to the, to the brain and is elaborated resulting in uh, neuroinflammation and then consequently uh, mental health problems and other behavioral um, challenges. So basically, essentially the hypothesis here is that um, that alcohol exposure is basically impacting the gut brain immune access at kind of all levels. But one of the key drivers may be that leaky gut leading to peripheral inflammation. So really to start to actually test this hypothesis, I started by, again, a very basic question and just examining whether prenatal alcohol exposure actually had a long lasting impact on the microbiome or not. Um, and so here I used a very simple animal model, the same one I talked about previously. We have dams are exposed to alcohol or just that typical um, controlled diet throughout pregnancy. Let them grow up during lactation, they're all eating the same food, same, same during uh, post weaning. And then I looked at postnatal day 80, so well into adulthood, um, and looked at the microbiome through 16S RNA sequencing. Um, to see, again, if that prenatal exposure actually had an impact on the microbiome or not. Um, and I looked at males and females. I think before I show the data, something I just wanted to mention is what was really wild to me at the time was that actually nobody had done this study yet. No one had actually looked at the impact of prenatal alcohol exposure on the microbiome at all. Um, and I'm talking clinical studies in humans with FASD or any preclinical model. Um, and this is Pretty shocking when you compare to the autism literature, for example, schizophrenia, there have been tens of thousands of papers and other neurodevelopmental disorders, but no one had looked at it at the time in prenatal alcohol exposure at all. So overall, what we saw um, was generally that yes, prenatal alcohol exposure had an impact on the microbiota. Um, we saw increases in the richness of the bacterial species that were present in response to that prenatal alcohol exposure here in this red group. We saw changes in the overall community structure um, between alcohol exposed animals and controls. And we also saw a lot of changes in the specific taxa that were present um, in alcohol exposed animals. And I think something that you know, was kind of interesting is that we also took this well into adulthood. So we weren't looking immediately after that exposure. We looked 80 days later, which is basically a lifetime later um, in these animals. And they had been you know, all eating the same diet in the same cages in the same environment. And still 80 days later, we saw a pretty strong signal of changes in, in the microbiome. Um, but as all good studies do, this, this study kind of raised a lot more questions um, along the way as well. And one of the big questions that I had was, essentially to kind of start to understand whether the changes in the microbiome were basically just being transmitted from the dam. Because we know there's a lot of vertical transmission in terms of the microbiome from dam to offspring. And so I wanted to just see if we could look at a microbiome in, uh, in the dams and compare that to that of the offspring, again, to see you know, if this is just sort of passing from 
um, mom to offspring. So I used the same animal model, but here I looked at uh, sequencing the microbiome on gestational day 14 in the dam, and then looked at an earlier time point um, at weaning in the offspring and kind of compared the signatures that, that we identified. And just to kind of give a big picture overview, one of the big, big takeaways from this study was that at all the metrics that we looked at, the impact of that prenatal alcohol exposure as compared to adult exposure in, in the mom, they looked very different. So this wasn't simply the transmission of that microbiome, alcohol exposed microbiome from mom to offspring, it wasn't just an inherited effect. Um, but also importantly, we did actually identify some changes in the microbiota that were similar in mom, her weanling offspring on postnatal day 22, as well as in um, the previous study in, in um, adults postnatal day 80 animals. And one of the changes that were consistent across all three of those studies um, was increases in Enterobacteraceae. Um, and this is actually was a really interesting finding because um, Enterobacteraceae actually contain a lot of pathogenic bacteria um, and blooms or expansions in, in this, uh, this taxa are actually linked to peripheral inflammation, which we are seeing um, in, these animal, in the animal model and clinical studies. It's also linked to gut dysbiosis, so imbalances in the gut bacteria, as well as poor gut health and health in general. So kind of coming back to that hypothesis, We've kind of sort of showed this piece here, um, and that may, that may be sort of getting back and linking some of those pathogenic bacteria to those increases in inflammation that we're seeing. All right, so in the remainder of my talk, I wanted to move into some of my ongoing and kind of future research. I think that's always the most exciting thing to see in, in presentations, the stuff that's not really out there yet. Um, and I want to talk on three different projects. Um, the first project basically is continuing to look at that gut brain immune axis in alcohol exposed animals, but starting to look at treatment options. You know, as much as I have, still have millions of questions in this model and want to see how it's all working out, I think it's also really important to start seeing if there are ways to kind of mitigate some of the effects um, that are occurring. And then the second study involves translating some of this work, um, animal work in, in health as well as uh, gut brain into adults with phenol alcohol spectrum disorder. And then finally, I wanna talk about some of my um, indigenous community research partnerships um, that aim more at prevention of prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, and of course, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna provide a really quick snapshot of, of each project, but I'm really happy to chat more in detail at the end or with questions. All right, so I mentioned I'm interested in looking at treatment options to help um, improve the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, and this project is um, part of an NIH grant with Dr. Weinberg here at UBC and Dr. Reinecke at Brock University. And we kind of propose a number of different um, treatment options that are kind of targeted at different aspects of that, that research framework that I showed you, or the gut brain immune system. Um, but the one I wanna talk about today is a treatment involving the antibiotic minocycline. Um, and so I'm using this antibiotic for a lot of reasons. Um, and of course it would likely have an impact on the microbiome. Um, but one of the really interesting things about this antibiotic specifically is that it targets microglia within the brain, which are key producers of cytokines. And so one of the ideas here was that we know there's central inflammation that's going on in this model. So if we actually target those cells during development, can we dampen that inflammation and could that lead to beneficial impacts? So that was kind of the idea. And so here to start to ask that question, I wanted to pair the treatment with a behavioral task. And I used the Barnes maze, which some of you will probably already be familiar with. Um, but it's basically the online version of the Morris water maze, um, a spatial learning and memory task. Um, and basically you place a rat in the middle of this platform. There's a whole bunch of holes that are, all of them are blocked except for one. And the open hole would contain an escape box underneath. So essentially the idea is the rats in the middle kind of circumnavigates that, that maze to find a place to escape. Rats are prey, they don't like to be out in the open, they wanna escape and hide somewhere. So that's kind of the general idea. Um, and there are multiple phases to this task. I'm gonna present data on one of those phases, but it, it's, a, it's a long process of learning to accomplish the task and finding that escape hole, and then you can change the rule on them, um, et cetera. So I just wanna show you what this kind of looks like in a rat that's really awesome at the task, essentially placed in the middle and just beelined it straight for that escape box, super quick. Um, and then this rat had about the same amount of training, et cetera. You kind of see the glare here, rat can't see this, but this is the escape box. And you can see that the rats react to go in the opposite quadrant, 
kind of beelined it back close-ish to where it needed to be, but really wasn't nearly as efficient as the previous animal in locating that escape box, kind of like tantalizingly close and finally finds it. Um, so basically anytime, there's a lot of different parameters that can be scored in this task, but essentially anytime a rat visits an incorrect circle, that can be scored as an error because they're basically visiting an incorrect spot and not locating that escape box. All right, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there's a lot of different phases of this task that you can look at. Um, but here I wanted to show the reversal phase. So basically what this phase involves is animals learn the location of the target hole here in red showing spot one. And then after they've learned it, they get a little holiday break from the task and then we retest them again later. But what we do is we shift the location of that previously correct hole to a new spot. So here, the shift is about 120 degrees. So here now the, the correct new um, location of that escape box is number seven. And again, you can look at a lot of different parameters, how long it takes them to learn this new rule, the distance they travel, um, et cetera. But one thing you can also look at is errors again. But here, basically what we're expecting is if rats remember how to do this task, they should kind of beeline it back to that hole number one, because they that's where they learned that escape box is located. They should kind of head over there, check it out, and then eventually start to develop a new strategy to locate um, a potential escape box. And if we look across trials and control animals, this is generally really what we see. We see what we're calling repeat errors. So this is repeat visits to that hole number one, that previously correct location. So what was really interesting is that alpha exposed animals just really didn't do that at all. They didn't, they essentially didn't make any repeat visits to that location. And so it really appears as if after that lag time, they're potentially not even remembering the location of that previously correct um, location of that correct escape box. But what was interesting is that with administering minocycline, animals then start to revisit um, that, that previously collect location. So it appears as if they have memory of the, um, of the task and the, the location of that escape box. Um, and again, I'm just showing one, um, one component of this task, but we see very similar effects in a lot of different metrics um, for this in this behavioral task. Um, so at least to, in some respects, when it comes to behavior, it looks at mi like minocycline is normalizing some of the behavioral effects that we see in this Barnes maze. Um, and we're also seeing uh, micro microbiome changes that maybe help at least explain to some extent this improvement. Um, but this is sort of ongoing stuff. So I'll just leave it as a teaser um, for now. All right, and the next project I wanted to chat about was um, work involving extending into adulthood. And before I talk about some of the data, I, re I just wanted to kind of highlight why this is important. Um, I think as someone who studies neurodevelopmental disorders, um, neurodevelopmental disorders are often kind of framed as childhood conditions. Um, and I think in the case of FASD, that's really, really prevalent. Um, you know, viewing this as a childhood condition that kids age out of essentially. Um, but really it, it's a problem because very little is known about how these, what health and well-being looks like in adults. Um, with FASD. And I think working a lot with families um, and, and adults with FASD, something they really want to know is what does their health look like? What are some potential health challenges? You know, what does the future hold? Um, what are what conditions are they maybe at more at risk of developing and why? So just as a, as a quick recap, I showed you that mental health and um, behavioral problems occur at higher rates in adults with FASD, um, as well as higher rates um, of inflammation, but really what's unclear is, is that inflammation kind of driving those mental health problems? And that's, that's what this um, study is kind of designed to help address. Um, and basically overall, my hypothesis is that um, prenatal alpha exposure results in kind of this low grade, lifelong heightened level of inflammation. And that over the life course, this may be a key driver of both physical and mental health problems in these individuals. So to begin to kind of address this hypothesis, um, we started recruiting a cohort of adults with FASD, as well as unexposed controls. Um, and this was in both an exciting and very challenging experience um, because this was the first cohort of adults with FASD to be recruited in Canada. Um, but we took advantage and, and looked at a bunch of different metrics. So basic stuff like you know, demographics, health surveys, mental health, cognitive function, as well as a whole really wide range of immune, um, immune measures. And just to kind of show basically what we're seeing is overall we're seeing 
um, immune changes, similar to what we saw in um, kids with prenatal alpha exposure that I showed you previously. Um, specifically, and an interesting finding was that we see overall increased levels of white blood cells in adults with FASD, um, just looking at white blood cells in general, but specifically this seems to be driven by increased levels of neutrophils and lymphocytes. And another really interesting finding that's suggestive of immune system dysfunction or changes, we also assessed um, basically preclinical symptoms of autoimmune diseases. So symptoms that might appear before a diagnosed um, autoimmune condition. And what we're seeing is really strong elevations um, of these preclinical symptoms of autoimmune diseases in uh, adults with FASD. But these adults are in and around average age of like 34, but really look like they're on the path to developing um, significant autoimmune conditions. And then when it came to mental health, um, we measured a bunch of different anxiety and depression. We used a bunch of different um, anxiety and depressive tasks. Interestingly, we didn't necessarily see a difference when it came to the levels of depression in uh, adults with FASD compared to unexposed individuals, but we did see higher rates of anxiety um, in these individuals. But something that I think is really important when thinking about mental health is we often kind of compartmentalize and look at depression, anxiety, stress, everything separately. Um, but what we decided to do is basically combine all of our mental health assessments together to produce what we're calling an emotionality score to kind of get at risk versus resilience to overall mental health problems. Um, so this is what we did. And here you can see, um, uh, I should say that a higher rate, a higher level of this emotionality score is a higher uh, indicator of mental health problems. And so what we see just looking at mean levels is we had a higher um, level of this emotionality score in adults with FASD. But I think really what the interesting finding is here is we sort of see these two groups. We see a subset of adults with FASD that look very much like, like the controls. Um, so this idea of risk versus resilience. And this is, this is something that I think is most exciting to kind of keep looking at um, because what makes some individuals with this condition more at risk versus others resilient. And specifically, we're, we're zooming in on the microbiota to see if there could be microbiome related changes that could be driving some of these differences. All right, and then just wanted to mention another um, translational component to this study. So in parallel with the human project that I just described, I also had an amazing opportunity to work on a complementary study in uh, vervet uh, monkeys. And this is a collaboration with an amazing researcher at Hill, um, Dr. Palmer, and also with uh, Dr. Reinecke. And here we're examining that same hypothesis um, as it, and in the human study, but we're able to extend it further into adulthood. So basically looking at whether there's increased inflammatory burden, low grade inflammation throughout the life course um, as a result of prenatal alpha exposure, but then is this potentially driving health problems and specifically accelerate, accelerated aging um, and functional decline in this model. And what's really exciting about this project is Dr. Palmer at McGill essentially exposed these animals to alcohol about 15 years ago. Um, so, and because this is a non-human primate study, we, these animals are still living in the colony and we have the opportunity to start to look at some of these aging outcomes in these animals. Um, and the life expectancy of these vervets in captivity is in around 20 years. So, um, it's kind of the perfect time point to start to look at aging. And, and actually I should mention, it's actually very hard to do in human studies because FASD was only first identified about 50 years ago and you're much more likely to have a diagnosis in childhood. So it's actually really hard to recruit people that are older than 50 for these studies because that would imply that they would have been diagnosed later on as adolescents or adults, which is just very uncommon. Um, so here we're assessing a lot of the parallel measures to the human study looking at markers and in, inflammation markers in the blood, looking at microbiome, but have the real unique opportunity to start to look at central changes as well. So we've collected cerebral spinal fluid and are uh, hopefully gonna be collecting some brain tissue at some point as well. So just to kind of give a snapshot of the preliminary data, this is a very much a work in progress um, currently, but what we're seeing really shockingly was that we look at just general life expectancy of the alcohol exposed animals compared to the controls, Alcohol-exposed animals were dying at an average age of about seven years old compared to about eight, just over 18 in the control. So their life expectancy was much less than half um, following that alcohol exposure. So something is definitely going on here. Um, and we, when we look generally at what are the, some of the causes of death in these animals, um, controls tend to die of things like pneumonia, which is common later on in life. Um, but when we look at the alcohol-exposed animals, they're dying of 
cardiac issues, even some vets are classifying some of the uh, cause of death as premature aging, just generally speaking. Um, and so now we're in the process of assessing whether some the inflammatory changes could be driving some of those um, poor health outcomes and early earlier uh, cause of death. All right, so with that in mind, I'm going to kind of shift gears a tiny little bit and talk about um, my community partnership, partnership research. Um, but first, I wanted to just start by just quickly chatting about um, alcohol use in more of an Indigenous context. And first, I really want to say this is actually a very complicated issue and something that probably deserves way more than a slide. Um, and there's also a lot of differences between communities, cultures, et cetera. But really, just to get the conversation started, um, I think it's important to mention that Indigenous Canadians actually report higher rates of alcohol abstinence at 26% compared to the rest of the population at 21%. Um, but what's different is that those who consume alcohol actually report higher rates of heavy drinking. Um, and about 75% of Indigenous communities identified alcohol as a community problem. But of course, there's a lot more to this story. Um, there are known very pervasive stereotypes and stigma associated with alcohol use in Indigenous communities. Um, been widely discussed that alcohol has been used as a means for coping with, you know, colonialism, intergenerational trauma inflicted by government programs like 60 Scoop, residential schools, etc. So really, really lots to unpack um, here, and I'm, I'm happy to chat more at the end as well. So with that context in mind, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, my project partnership with communities, but here I wanted to take maybe less of a traditional Western approach to kind of talking about the project and really just tell the story of where the project started, where it's going, and where I hope to see it go, see it go in the future. Um, so basically where the project started was with a really cool um, CIHR initiative that they called an idea fair and learning circle. And it basically brought Indigenous people together into a space to just talk about research, research priorities, build partnerships, open up conversations. Um, and really the goal here was to bring Indigenous research back into the hands of Indigenous people. Like that was the priority. And so I attended this event, just sort of thinking it would be an interesting point of connection, um, but really made some really exciting connections with others and decided to pursue a project further. And so basically what I did was put in a, put in a grant for that, for that call, which was funded. But I think the really exciting and novel um, CIHR perspective here was that they didn't view this as your traditional grant with preliminary data and here's your plan and here's your aim and here's what you're going to do and why. It was essentially like, if you can put in a good idea, we will give you money to talk to communities because we don't want you to go into a community and do stuff that maybe they don't want you to do. Um, we want this to be a partnership with community. So that was the most exciting aspect for me because essentially it meant that we got money over a few years to talk to a community and decide if, if there would be a project there, if there was something that could benefit health in this community. So I partnered with an amazing researcher um, in Dr. Lori Cox in um, Elsa Pogtog First Nation in New Brunswick. Um, and basically we just started talking with community members. We met with elders, we met with community leaders, teachers, principals, uh, and just tried to talk about what are some strengths in the community? What are some challenges? Um, we're both uh, study prenatal alcohol exposure. So of course that was definitely in our mind, um, but we just wanted to just hear from the community and see if a project involving some sort of alcohol related theme or substance use would be of interest um, in the community. And pretty quickly it was identified that alcohol is a big problem in the community. We kind of knew that a little bit to some extent going in, but what was exciting was that the community was really open to that conversation around how to decrease alcohol consumption, what might be ways to re, re sort of connect um, especially youth to their community and sort of flip flip the sort of pattern of FASD that had been occurring um, in that community. It also was timed really well and very poorly and really well for two different reasons. This actually occurred, the grant was funded March 2020. So as soon as COVID hit, which made things really challenging, but actually I think led to some different opportunities. Um, but also the the uh, community was just opening a new school. So that was an exciting point to start connecting with students because they went from very minimal equipment to being able to actually bring in some other equipment and to, to do some more science-based things. So what did we do? All of this was, again, totally driven by the community. But basically what we learned was that kids, 
the community basically wanted the change to start with kids. They wanted kids to better understand alcohol, its potential effects. Um, and that was critical. And I had done a previous project here in Vancouver with Let's Talk Science, where we had done some science experiments to, to teach kids about alcohol to some extent. And so we basically took that as a starting point. Um, so basically experiments where kids take uh, C. elegans and brine shrimp and expose them to alcohol and look at the effects. Um, and, but we did things very differently in this classroom and with kids in the Indigenous community. Because basically in conversation, it, it was a tricky, tricky place to be because a lot of kids in the classroom had FASD, had history of alcoholism, had a really complicated relationship with alcohol. So we didn't want to come in and start just talking, take the dare approach of like, alcohol is bad, it does this. We really just wanted to, to look at things a lot differently. And so in consultation with the community, what we decided was make a lot of sense to just actually start having kids design an experiment. So we gave them the bare bones. We gave them the C. elegans, the roundworms. We gave them, you know, alcohol. We let them decide what concentration of alcohol to use. We let them decide what metrics they wanted to use to assess the impact. It worked amazingly and had some challenges. Some kids just dumped 100% ethanol and like nuked everything. They learned something and then we tried again, but we literally let them do whatever they wanted to do. And I think that was just for kids, you know, that have always been told a lot in a lot of their science classrooms, we add this and then we do that and we try this approach. They had total creative freedom, but it also just, it allowed them, it wasn't us talking. It allowed them to do something, see the effect and then start to open up. And that I think worked really well because again, it didn't have, they didn't have to talk about their own experience with alcohol, drinking exposure or whatever. They could talk about the worm. They could focus on the worm and like that worked out really well. Um, the other thing that was really important to the community was re-engaging the connection between elders and youth, um, because elders really are sort of the knowledge keepers in the community, and, but there was a bit of a disconnect between those two groups. And so really what we designed was then, following the experiment, was this idea that kids would then engage in various activities led by elders, so like basket weaving, art activities, whatever it might be. And we just kind of hang out and start talking. Some kids then were, felt like sharing lots of information and, you know, talking about their experiences and challenges and things like that. Other kids would really just sort of focus in on the activity that they were doing and just kind of see where it all played out. Um, so that's kind of what we what we designed with with the youth. And I think where I sort of see this going is, you know, one of the big things that got brought up as part of this, I say, CRTR experiment is how do you make this long term? How is this not just you coming in, doing something, maybe providing a benefit, but then leaving and the project ends there? Same with, you know, when there's funding and a community gets a new gym or something, and then there's no funding to keep the heat on, and that has limited effects. And so, really, what we're trying to do now is um, partner, working to partner with another community and actually bring youth who participated in this first stage into other communities to kind of be the leaders and help mentor other students and open up that conversation. And then similarly in this Elsa Pogtog community, have those students who participated in shaping as well as, you know, community members, then pass it on to the next set of students to sort of be youth mentors is really where I see and hope the project will go because then it's not limited on the researchers. It can be kind of continued on by students. Um, but I think something that's really important to recognize as well is every community is different. And so as I work to partner with other communities, it's not necessarily going in with the idea that the exact same project would benefit another community, but really sort of starting from scratch and, and rehabbing those conversations. All right, so with that, I think I'm out of time, um, but I really wanted to thank all of my mentors, collaborators who've all um, participated and contributed to this work in a variety of ways, um, as well as the students uh, without whom this work would definitely not be possible um, and the funding support that made, that made it all possible as well. And yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Kath, do you want to ask your question? Hi, Tammy. Uh, thanks for an amazing talk. Um, I'm kind of blown away by your ability to leap from rats and mice to humans to microbiome to behavior. But anyway, um, my question 
Uh, so one of the students in one of my fourth year classes brought this um, paper to my attention and they were looking at how the change induced by a high fat diet, the microbiome in mice could be reversed. Um, well, A, it caused a long lasting change, potentially not exactly similar to the, the alcohol induced diet, but same kind of idea, like long-term exposure leading to changes in um, bacterial composition. And they found that it could be, this group of researchers in nature found that it could be partially reversed and the behavioral effects reversed by exposing animals to uh, a very healthy diet, rich in flavonoids, which is a compound that's, that's present in things like broccoli. Um, and I was wondering, like, is there, could there be an opportunity to try and, you know, produce some symptom relief in those with FASD through a really healthy diet manipulation? And also what challenges that might mean for, you know, particularly underserved, you know, more remote communities that are already in a bit of a food desert. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. That's a really, really great question. Something I've definitely thought a lot about. I think what comes to mind first, especially in the translational perspective, is what are the what are going to be the challenges? And I think something something that's really hard is that in a lot of the families that I've worked with, you know, there's not necessarily a lot of excess income to support the most healthy diet. Um, so that could be a very big barrier to actually, you know causing being able to to sort of provide this diet um but i think it likely would have a, a big impact and and in talking as part of the microbiome studies we do food diaries so we have people record it's not necessarily the absolute best way to do this but we have people record what they ate over the last 24 hour period to kind of get a snapshot of what they're eating and there's a little bit of evidence that maybe food preferences are potentially affected in individuals with FASD, but we're seeing some really wild and unfortunately really unhealthy diets um, in these adults. And so I think, you know, broadly speaking, a, a healthy diet moves a lot of outcomes. I think even, you know, tacking in exercise, those two things would probably have a lot, have a lot of benefits. But I think a, a really big problem is just going to be how to go about doing that and sustaining that. Um, I also got, I got a question recently that I think is similar to this around um, Indigenous populations, because something I didn't mention is that the majority of our population in the adult study uh, in FASD, the majority of the individuals with FASD are Indigenous. Um, and so something that has been brought up is, can you even compare people that are maybe consuming more of a traditional diet? Would that have some symptom mitigation? And I think that's like, would be a really, really cool and interesting question. Um, but the, again, the problem is how to go about delivering that and continuing that. So yeah, probably yes, but hard to do maybe. Thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, the, your, your translational approach is really uh, kind of dazzling and inspiring. So thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions, but first of all, um, is it possible to go back to the slide where you were looking at the, you, you had the emotionality score and you were looking at the effects on yeah, anxiety and depression? Yeah. Yeah. So um, how did you generate the emotionality score? Yeah. So all, all of our tests that we were using, like back depression, back anxiety, all have summary scores. And so mm -hmm. we took those summary scores and essentially Z scored them and some of okay. them along, you know, it, some of them you had to flip to, to assume yeah. like a higher score means um, impaired performance. But yeah, just to summarize all of those. Okay. So you, you, but you, you derived them from the BAI and the BDI. Yeah. So did you ever look at, did you ever separate out those who were high, like had high BAI scores and high BDI scores from those who were just high in one or the other? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, no, actually not yet. In general, they tend to overlap pretty consistently. If they were high on BDI, they were high on Right. So there BDI. weren't that many that weren't sort of comorbid in, in high anxiety. No, I'm sure there's, there's likely a, a, a small subset. And I think because exactly what we want to do is to, to look at those two subgroups. And I think as the more people we can bring in, that might pull out some that are maybe high in one and low in another, but not generally what we're seeing. Yeah, that's interesting. So we've been looking at a community sample, undergraduates and online workers. And we're finding a fairly distinct pattern of people who are high in both compared to those who are high in one or the other, but we have enough people who are just high in one or the other to be able to make yeah. that comparison. Yeah, I'd love to be able to do that. So I have, a, I have another, um, just a, a, a curiosity question, but earlier you were, you were talking about 
it was in the rodents and you talked, I think it was the, the fetal alcohol exposed group were um, richer at, at a greater richness in bacterial species. Yeah. Which was just interesting because knowing nothing about it, I would just say intuitively they would have fewer bacterial species. So I just wondered yeah. what, what that means. That's a great question. And that was honestly my first impression too, as a non-microbiologist, like, isn't this good? Should this, is this beneficial? But I think it's kind of a summary metric that doesn't necessarily, it tells you about composition, but it's all about what those tax actually are. And so when you start to dive in and see, oh, there's actually elevations in pathogenic bacteria, it, it, the, the sum score means something, but it's actually the taxa that are elevated or decreased that matter the most. Um, and actually like comparing this to the literature in general, it's uh, something very similar seen in autism too. And they see it kind of a similar thing, like higher um, diversity, but it's some more pathogenic bacteria that are dominating. Interesting. Okay. That, that makes sense. Okay. Last question. <laughs> this is more a fangirl question, but how did you come to the idea of using CCPA with the uh, cytokine community uh, networks? Because that was really interesting to me. I'm used to CBCA being applied to, you know, in networks the of the bold response in the brain. Yeah. So actually it was, I think neuroscience research day back in like, maybe like 2017, something like that, where Todd Woodward presented his amazing CPCA sort of stuff. And I don't know, I just, to me, it just seemed like, I know it's typically used in imaging and it has a lot of benefits there, but it, it, I was just at that moment in my science trying to figure out how do I look at 40 things and summarize them together and take out the noise. Um, and so just kind of went to chat to him and sort of said like, hey, will you teach me this? And would you think it might work in this type of study? And it, he was like, sure. And it kind of did. Thank you. Echoing everyone else, that was a wonderful talk and really cool translational approach. Um, I was wondering, in your human studies, you see these different profiles for risk and resilience in both like cytokines and um, behavioral measures. Do you see that in um, the animal models and especially within the offspring of the same dam? That's a really, really good question. So generally speaking, yes, we do see risk resilience. And we actually have a parallel animal study where we're looking at a bunch of different behavioral tasks like stress, anxiety, depression, and looking for risk resilience to try to figure out, because it does happen too. Um, what we do though is we consider the litter RN. So if a mom has 15 pups, then only one animal from that litter will, will be assigned to an experimental group. And part of that is, you know, you may see more similar effects within litter, but something that is interesting about the alcohol exposure model that we use is it's ad lib. So some um, dams will drink a ton and over the course of their gestation, some will have blips where they drink more, others will drink lower amounts. And so something we often do is actually look, look at our outcomes and relate them back to the consumption. Um, and so some of the immune outcomes are actually directly proportional to how much they drank um, over, cause we have like a day by day accounting of that. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a really good point for why, you know, you have to kind of consider your litter as one, as one sample. But I think it's also something I really like about this model compared to let's say other models of like an injection of alcohol is that you have that variability um, because that's probably what's happening very clearly in people. No, you know, two people aren't necessarily drinking the same amounts. And so I think there's power, the, the variability can be annoying sometimes in your statistics, but there's also power and translational potential for that variability. It's really cool, thank you. Um, I mean, one thing that, that I thought of right away when you were, um, yeah, presenting like the richness in the microbiome and so on in the, in the rat and the rodents was just the, um, the life of a rodent in a, in a, well, for us in a cage that usually has a lid and is very controlled. And, um, and so I was, where are they coming from? Like, it's just such a clean environment. So do you have a special, you know, colony where they're exposed to more, you know, a natural environment or, or not, or what? Well, yeah. So I think this is where it's going to be really important to kind of compare what we see in the rodent to, let's say the non-human primate where they're living outside, there's lots more exposures to then humans where people eat all sorts of different things, different genetic backgrounds, et cetera. 
Um, in, in the rodent study here, we weren't, it wasn't like this rat in a bubble type thing. We actually put them in some behavioral tasks. Like we tried to do as much as we could to kind of contain, you know, filter tops, like all those kinds of things. Um, but you know, we, we can't, we couldn't sort of keep them locked up. Some of it is probably coming from the diet. Um, you know, some of it is transmitted from the offspring or from the mom to offspring. Um, you know, that that's where the diversity is coming from. But I think for me, the, the big question that I want to kind of see resolved is, especially when it comes to the animal work in, um, the microbiome, the diet of a rat is going to be very different from the diet of a person. So I think I'm trying to like, the, I think the pathogenic bacteria are really interesting and could kind of explain some things, but I'm trying not to hang on to individual taxa and over sort of state their importance. Cause you could essentially take all three data sets, the rat, the non-human primate, human, dump them all together and see what are, is there a signature of alpha exposure across all three? And I think, especially because there's no literature really in the area, that's kind of what's going to be needed to get outside of just food differences, vivarium differences, water, like all these factors are going to have a big, a big role. But what we really want to know is what does the exposure actually do? It's probably too early to say exactly. Hi, Tammy. That was a really, really good talk. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed it. I was really um, interested about the treatment um, experiment that you did by giving them, I think it was an antibiotic that targets microglia in the brain. So is that really specific to um, dampening the effects of inflammation in the brain specifically, or is that also like a systemic effect? Yeah. So again, I think the, the reason we decided to go with it, because it has an established like microglial dampening effect, but of course it's, it has a lot of other effects too. And so at the time, this is, you know, very critical that if you're going to look at an antibiotic, it's probably critical that you look at the microbiome. We're also assessing inflammation and it looks like it sort of generally dampens peripheral inflammation as well, um, as well as central inflammation. So yes, like very, if you actually, you know, slice the brain, stain microglia, you can see them going instead of sort of being a more activated state, they're in a more quiescent state. So definitely having that effect, but yes, it has like peripheral dampening effects as well. But I think in this model, it's probably beneficial because you're kind of hitting multiple levels. You won't necessarily know exactly which level is causing the effect, but since we see the inflammation kind of throughout, then it could be beneficial. Just a quick follow-up question. How long did you expose the animals to the? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention that part. So, um, actually two different exposures that generally show pretty similar effects. The first one was during lactation. So we gave the minocycline in the water to the dam. It's been shown that it passed through the milk and then you get exposure in the offspring. The reason it's kind of a, maybe a weird way of doing it, but it's kind of a proof of principle because we know that postnatal day eight, we were seeing really big uh, elevated inflammation. So we wanted to target that postnatal day eight. The only way to do it without stressing the offspring is to give it to the mom. Um, but probably translational potentials of that to humans or anything else is, is stretch. Um, so we also administered it to another cohort of animals in adolescence, um, but generally see pretty parallel effects in terms of the outcomes like inflammation and behavior, but it remains to be seen the effect on the microbiome might be different. Thank you. If there are no more questions, please join me again to thank Dr. Bodner for an amazing talk.